thank you for all for coming to this talk. Um, I always enjoy giving talks like this. It's fun to discuss sort of my ideas around product and how I built it based on the experiences that I had. So um, what have I done? Um, I am the co-founder of Different, uh, which is based here in Australia. We're a prop tech startup. Um, we are focused on rebuilding property management, but ultimately what we really want to be is the assistant for your home. So how did I get here? Um, I started life out as an engineer a long, long time ago. In fact, it was so long ago that my very first job was actually making BlackBerry apps when that was cutting edge technology. Um, and so after that, I decided I really needed to find real technology. And I moved away from New York and went to California and started working at Google. Um, loved it, had an amazing time there, and then got bitten by the startup bug and decided I really wanted to feel what it was like to be at a startup. Meandered my way through a few different startups and ultimately ended up at a little one at the time um, called Uber. So I was the first product manager at Uber, um, ultimately ended up uh, building out the product management team, um, being head of product. And I started Uber when I was at 20 people. It was probably somewhere between four and 5,000 when I left. So an incredible experience, um, unbelievable scale and growth, um, and really kind of a once in a lifetime experience. So once I left, I took about four months off and did nothing, because um, I needed to take a break and get back to normal, and then was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I knew that I love product, I knew that I love tech, and I was trying to figure out what path did I want to go down? Did I want to be an investor or did I want to be a founder? And, um, and so I explored the investment path. I worked with several um, venture capital firms as um, an advisor um, and really kind of got a sense of what it was like to be on that side of the table. And at the end of about a year or so of that, I was like, nah, you know what? I'm ready to get back to building. And, um, and so I started different um, with my co-founder who actually also happens to be my husband. Um, so I'm here today to chat with you about Oh, the humanity. What do I mean by this? Um, actually, it's, it's, um, I like the title, Oh, the humanity, but what I'm here to actually talk about is how do we use technology to create scalable experiences? And you might be wondering why this is the cover image of this talk. And so if you're not familiar with what this is, uh, it's Florence. So um, it's, a, it's a city of Florence. And this dome that you see right up here is the dome of Florence Cathedral, or Santa Maria dei Fiore. And I think it's actually a really great metaphor for talking about how to use technology to create scalable experiences. So I'll, I'll set the scene for you a little bit. This is Florence in the 15th century, the early 15th century, and there's a giant hole in the, in the, in the roof of the cathedral, so they have to fix it. Um, and so the painters and the architects get together and they're like, we've got this idea. We are gonna build this dome. And so they, they, they painted a picture of the dome and then they took all the constructors and they swore them to the plan, swore them to the plan upon God. The problem was nobody had any idea how to actually build this thing because it was this huge, massive dome. And they didn't know how to build it in such a way that the weight of the dome wouldn't collapse upon itself. Um, they had to work with the existing infrastructure of the walls, which are octagonal walls. They couldn't rebuild it. Um, they didn't know about compression. Mortars would set in a couple of days, so there was no way to know whether or not things would stay in place. And also, in order to create the scaffolding to actually have people work up there, there, it was impossible to find A, enough rafters, and the size and the strength of rafters that you need. So basically, they're like, we've sworn to God that we're going to create this dome, but we have absolutely no idea how to do it, and no materials, and no concept of what's going on. How did they do it? Well, enter Filippo Brunelleschi, who, by the way, at the time, was known as a buffoon and a babbler. Now, Filippo Brunelleschi was not an architect. In fact, he was a goldsmith. And he's a goldsmith, though, who actually is a technical genius. Now, you may not have heard of Filippo Brunelleschi. You probably know Leonardo da Vinci. But I really love Brunelleschi, and I think he was, he, he was before Leonardo da Vinci. And in fact, it's an interesting thing. He was really interesting stuff about Brunelleschi. You should read a book by this guy named Ross King called Brunelleschi's Dome, which is all about it. But I'll tell you one anecdote, which is that he was famously secretive. And, um, and he used to you know, write all his little diagrams and things in his book and hide the books from everyone else. He didn't want anyone else to do it. Somehow Leonardo da Vinci got a hold of one of these books and was like playing around with it and trying to think about it. And so some of Brunelleschi's achievements have actually been attributed to da Vinci, which is probably making Brunelleschi turn his grave. But Brunelleschi basically, like I said, he wasn't, wasn't an architect. He was just a mathematical genius. And so he thought about sort of what was available to him at the time. And he had these incredible um, advancements of um, just building machinery, creating hydraulic machinery, and developing all of these things to ultimately create the dome of Florence. And it's, um, the, it was the largest dome in the world by far um, at the time in, in the 1400s. And in fact, it's actually to this day still the largest brick and mortar dome in the world. And so to me, that really is a great example of using technology to create something that is genuinely 
awe-inspiring and makes you feel humanity. Like it's, you, I don't know if you've ever been, if you ever get a chance to go, whether you see the, the cathedral like from the outside, anywhere within Florence, it truly is a beautiful awe-inspiring site. And when you go inside and you look at it, it's equally awe-inspiring. And, and one other thing, by the way, about this dome, the city fathers of Florence forbade buttresses, which is external support. So they had to build this dome without any external supports as well, because it was literally forbidden by the rulers of Florence. And so I just think that it's such an incredible inspiration for what we do on a day-to-day -day basis as technologists. We're building products. Now, we may not build awe-inspiring architecture um, you know, in like beautiful parts of the world, but what we do every day is we create products and things that people use, and those build experiences. And, and I find that really genuinely inspiring. So it depresses me a little bit when I go to a, a Google image search for technology, and like these are the images that come up. I'm like, this isn't technology, this doesn't inspire me. I'm not, I'm not excited by this. This isn't what gets me going every day because it's lacking in humanity. And I think that is the biggest thing that as product people, as designers, as engineers, what we do is we create experiences and experiences are the most important thing. They're much more important than technology. We don't build technology, we create experiences. That's what great products are about. Unfortunately, most companies don't create humane experiences. So, you know, like here's just a couple of examples of them. L low, low NPS companies in low NPS industries. Who, who here has ever said, man, I love Telstra? <laughs> I, I've had, I won't even go into my experiences with Telstra. Um, but the thing is that while it's true that there are many, many companies like this, there are also companies who do create great experiences. And, and here's just a few examples of them that I personally think are, are amazing. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that these companies are perfect. They aren't. Um, but they, for the most part, are they're, they're, they're all public companies with millions of users. And somehow, at scale, they have developed a way to create experiences that people love. Like Tesla, I, I find this shocking. Um, its NPS is 96 or 97. 91% of Tesla owners say that they would buy another Tesla. That's pretty damn incredible, I think. Apple has been around for years, and still we have people who love Apple. Although I still think that the iPhone 11, like, is it just me, or does the back of that camera look like a stove? Like, I'm very confused. Um, but that aside, these are companies that people say, I love Slack, I love Tesla, I love Apple. So what is it? What is it about them that they do that, that just makes them so great? I'm here to tell you. It's not easy. There's no secret, there's no silver bullet. And that's the thing with a lot of, a lot of talks like this, is that um, you know, we come up here and we talk about all of these things that we can do, and the answer is that these are just frameworks. You, you could slavishly follow every single thing that Slack did, that Apple did, that Tesla did, and you might still end up failing. So the answer is not about doing what somebody else does, it's actually really about looking very deeply at what it is that you do, thinking about some of the principles and why those principles are applied for that particular company and for its users and what it's trying to do. And, and hopefully I can talk to you a little bit about some of the things that I found helpful in my approach to building product um, and how I've, how I've used those, those things there. But as I said, there, there is no secret. There's, there's, no, there's no manual you can follow. It, it is so much about taking ideas and understanding why those ideas worked and finding the rules and applying them for your own company and for your own user. One thing though, before I get into talking about creating scalable experiences, is that for any company, regardless of what it is that you do, the one thing you have to focus on is actually to start non-scalably. You have to feel the pain, and that, that's actually one of my company's values, feel the pain. Because the answer is, if you haven't started non-scalably and you haven't built something that your customers actually like to begin with, you're not gonna have anything to scale. You have to start early and think about what it is that you're trying to create. How do you want people to feel? And how can you do that in a way that makes sense? So I, one story that I really love in terms of a, a great example of thinking about building things non-scalably is um, Airbnb. And Airbnb, when they first started, um, when, like, how, how are we gonna get photos of these places that we're trying to list online? And they actually had professional photographers. They went out and they took the photos themselves. They created these beautiful, really stunning examples of what it is. Now that doesn't scale when you've got millions and millions of properties, how do you do that? But if you didn't start with this thing where people went to Airbnb and were like, wow, these photos are so great. I really feel like I could see myself in this place it would never have gotten to where it is today. And so I think that's a really important concept. Before you even start thinking about scalable experiences, start non-scalable, you have to understand how people feel, what makes them tick, 
Why does that experience work? So speaking of frameworks, what do I think makes for great scalable experiences? Um, I think they need to be timely. I think they need to be personal. And I think they need to be humane. And I don't think this is a word that's used enough when we think about the process of creating products and of creating technology. I think people focus too much on the technology itself. At the end of the day, technology is a means to an end. To me, the best technology is something that creates an experience that makes people feel good. And I think we have to be humane in our approach to these things. And so what I'll do is talk to you a little bit about what I mean about being timely, about being personal, about being humane, some of my experiences in building products that have gotten there, and, um, and yeah, and why, why I think they work. So being timely, um, what does it mean to be timely? I think it's understanding when in a particular path, when in a particular flow, you actually want to insert your product. Because at the end of the day, almost invariably, you are inserting your way into something. You're not just part of what someone else is doing, going along their own merry way, like you're actually pushing yourself into it. And if you're gonna push yourself into it, then you wanna do it in a way that feels right, that feels appropriate. And I think where you have to start with that is actually obsessively mapping your customer flow. This is one of the most important things I think you can do. And mapping your customer flow is not just about sort of thinking about the tasks that happen, but also at any given point along that customer flow, what are the emotions that are happening during that time? And I think also, secondly, what are the things that are outside of your control, outside of your flow, the things that are happening away from that, that you also have to be aware of, that can impact the way that somebody feels and the way that somebody's thinking about what it is they're trying to do in that task. So one example that I really think is a, is a great one of this is the Uber driver app. Um, many people are familiar with the Uber rider app, I'm sure, and it's a, it's a great app, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a consumer app. I really love products that most people don't get to see, which I think is like stuff like all of the things on like, like people talk about like backend tools and admin portals. And I actually think those are the sexiest products. They're most interesting and the most exciting. And they're really, really hard. And they're the things that make a difference about whether or not a company is successful or not. So the driver app is, um, Really exciting, and this, is a, this was part of a, a big rework that we did on the driver app. So this is the, the original driver app back in like 2011. Fun fact, by the way, I was the voice on the you have arrived on the driver app um, back then. <laughs> um, and I had to record it in I think like three languages and then fortunately we gave up on it and like went down a different path. Um, but you can, see, you can see that there's a big difference here, especially imagine when driving, right? That there are a lot of things that come into play with regards to the driver customer flow. All these things that we are just not in control of, um, which, which is true for, for any app that has sort of GPS or navigation built into it, right? Like you're on the road, it's crazy weather conditions, it's traffic, there's something else. You're driving, you're zooming, you're navigating, you're trying to figure out where is the person, where are they? Are they on this side of the street? It's dark, I can't see them. What are they wearing? What's going on? There are a lot of things that play into that. You have to think about the stress levels because also the other thing here is like, why are people using the Uber driver app? They're using it to make money, right? And so the longer it takes, for them to start on the thing that gives them money, the worse it's going to be for them, the stress levels are going to increase. Things change a lot as well when we talk about being timely in terms of things like what does somebody feel like when they start using the driver app, like right at the beginning of their shift, for lack of a better word? What does it feel like after they've been driving for four hours? How should the app change? What are the things that need to come into play? Should it tell you that you should take a break? Um, you know, if you've been doing like trip after trip after trip with barely a chance in between, especially if it's late at night, what should you do? So I think these are the things that really come into play and there's a lot of thinking around that that went into this newly redesigned driver app, including stuff like, hey, when should I drive? What times can I make the most money that will match with my schedule and how might that work? There's a lot of thought and a lot of work that went into thinking about that and so much of it is about being humane, being timely. That, that's a good experience if you're a driver. Now, of course, there's more work to do, but um, you know, it, there's been a lot of thought into how this is done. Um, at different, we have a similar sort of thing. So much of what we do is we manage residential properties. Really important thing is that like leases come up for renewal and we want people to feel like they have a place they can stay roof over their heads. And so actually, um, this is what I, I'm a big, big believer in GIFs. And so <laughs> many of our, our emails actually have these GIFs in them. And so this is the like lease renewal email, letting you know that, hey, your lease is going to be coming up for renewal. And there's very specific legislative requirements around the timeline of when we have to send 
emails, uh, when we have to send these release renewals, notices that we can give people, when tenants need to know, when owners need to know. And we try to do this in such a way where you can plan for the future because you're trying to figure out where you're gonna live. That's a big decision. How do we help you do that? How do we do that in a way that works for you as a tenant and also for the owner as well? And we have to be timely on both sides, you know, to actually to manage that. So a big part of this, we really sat down and we thought, hey, what are all of the places where people need to know about how a lease renewal should work? How do we match that up with legislative requirements? How do we do it in a way where it doesn't feel scary, where it's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I have to think about this thing that I didn't really want to think about. But at the same time, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I should be aware of that. What am I thinking about? How do I make that feel? And really changing the nature of what that conversation is by thinking about the timelines and not waiting until the last minute to be able to do it. So that's what I mean about being timely. <laughs> being personal. What does it mean to be personal? I think mean, there's a lot of different ways you can interpret this in terms of what it, what it actually means. I think an important thing is as human beings, we want to believe that we're unique. And for the most part, we are. Each of us is driven in different ways. We have multiple things that, um, you know, drive, that move us and motivate us to get us to certain things. When it comes to building technology, how do, you, how do you take that in? How do you enable it? And I think one of the most important things about that is like this very humane, personal experience is something that is actually really well enabled in tech by using structured data. And so as much information as you can take about a customer to classify and define them at different, for example, we think about actually four different areas or objects within our, within our, in, within our e overall ecosystem. Properties, owners, tenants, and tradespeople. And we think what are all of the things that we want to map about properties, about owners, about tenants, and about tradespeople? And how can we do it in a way that is captured through structured data? So it's not like a notes field on a particular object where it's a whole bunch of free text. Because what can you do with that? How can you take that and enable it to be able to create a really good conversation? It's hard, it's really hard to do. And so what we wanna do as much as possible is be able to say, oh, you know what, this is an owner, this is their age, um, this is their any sort of demographic information, but also like, hmm, this owner really likes long emails. This owner prefers to be called rather than email. This owner loves text messages as much as possible. Taking information from our owner apps and our owner portals to say, hey, what are the places where this owner likes to do the, the most things? This owner really likes to be communicated with at the end of the month as they're thinking about the money coming into their bank account. This owner is very specific about maintenance requests and like specifically relating to the plumbing of their particular property. So. The more and more detailed you can get about this, the better you're able to use that as a system to actually design really personal and really unique experiences for that particular person. I'll give you another example of a time where, um, you know, I worked at a company called ModCloth, which was a fashion and e-commerce company. And one of the things we were trying to figure out is like, hey, how, Fashion is an incredibly unique thing. Like our bodies are all completely different, especially with women. Like it's like all over the place in terms of like a, a, a size 10 here has absolutely no relation to a size 10 from this designer. It just, it means, it means nothing. So how as a person buying fashion, can you understand what size am I? How does this work? Will this work for me? And so one of the things we thought about is like, well, what if there's a way that we can rebuild this through the process of reviews. And so the interesting thing we did with reviews was to think about how can we make reviews instead of being like five stars, you know, because what I don't know, what does five stars might mean something completely different to you than it does to me, right? I, I can't guarantee that it means the same thing. Is we actually use this different approach where we, we ask people to specifically categorize things on fit, on length, on quality, and we gave them really specific things, and then we ask people for their measurements, which seems really counterintuitive, right? Where it's like, whoa, who's gonna put their measurements up on a website? And again, this is something that is all about knowing your customer, knowing your user. At Moncloth, we had this big idea of community. So the people who used Moncloth very much had this idea of community. Like, we're all in this together. We're here to like pay it forward. We will put our measurements on the website. Now, we, we manage a lot of stuff around this, doing a really fun marketing launch to get people to feel comfortable at putting those measurements up. But they did. And when they did, it completely changed, A, how people reviewed, how people bought. And as a result, essentially, like, all these things that we do at the end of the day have to, have to drive forward some, some goal for the company. And for us, the goal for the company is well, we have to increase revenue, right? We've got to get more people to buy more things. But we want to do it in a way where it's not just like, oh, I'm just buying for the sake of buying. I'm not buying it because it's like 60% off. I'm buying it because I genuinely believe that I will look good in it, that I will feel better, and that like, you know, fashion is a really interesting way to express myself uniquely. And, and that was the reasoning behind Modcloth and, and the way that reviews work. It was incredibly powerful. So similarly, 
One of the things we do different is we think about maintenance. So one of the most common things, obviously, if you're a tenant, is that when there's a problem in the home, you've got to call your property manager and figure out how to do this. Now, if you're really lucky, maybe your property manager uses email. If you're really, really lucky, maybe they'll even reply back to your email. So that's, that's just not ideal. When you've got a problem in the home, you want it fixed. So the way that we work through this in our tenant app is like, how do we make it easy to report a problem. Like we, want, we don't want people to not report problems because it's hard, because we created some clunky user interface that like is not easy to use and is really difficult to send out. We want people to report the problems, but we want them to do it in a way where we can act on it intelligently, which is why the process of creating a maintenance request um, at different is that first you identify, hey, is it throughout the whole house or is it in a specific room? Oh great, it's in a specific room, cool, which room is it in? Is it any one of these five common issues that we see all the time? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, it's that leaky sink in the bathroom. Great, no problem. Take a quick picture, take a video, and add a note, and we'll make sure that somebody gets in and taken care of. Because in our side, when we now receive that request, we know it's not just a bunch of text. It's actually, oh, there's leaky sink in the bathroom at this property, and here's the video of it. We can act on that immediately. We can use technology to act on that quickly, to respond to it fast, and be able to provide a solution, as opposed to somebody sitting there trying to figure out what is this piece of free text, and what does it mean, and when did it come in, and how do we do this? And that's, I think, a really important part of this, is that ultimately, again, it, the whole point is to make experiences better. Make it easier for you to be able to report a maintenance request. More importantly, make it easier for you to get the problem in your home fixed. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to do things to like, you know, just collect data for the sake of collecting data. We're collecting data so that we can build a workflow, we can build automation, we can build systems on top of it that move quickly, that actually create and solve the problem that you set out to solve to begin with. And if our tenants are happy, we're happy too. And if it makes our owners happy, we're happy there too. And so that, that's the whole point, is how do we do things that can make all of our people happy, solve the problems of the business, but at the same time, do it in a way that shows people that you care. That's what being personal is about. Being humane, and again, I just I really feel like in our industry we don't use this word enough. We don't build technology for the sake of building technology. Like the things that inspire me, the things that get me to come to work every day and build products and think about what we want to do are that we we make things better, we make people feel good, and I think that's a really important thing. Is that great products evoke emotion? It doesn't matter what industry you're in. It doesn't matter what you're building, what you do. The great products make people feel something. They make people feel good, whether it's the awe-inspiring dome of the Florence Cathedral or that little like joy you get when you get all your unread messages in Slack. Like it doesn't matter what it is, you feel good. So I, I just uh, you know I feel I've worked on a bunch of things and I was like, oh, what what could be fun here? I thought this one's a, the fun one too. Uh, oh, I don't know if it'll. Let's see if it plays. And this was one of our, our first uh, first things that we did, did at Uber, 2012, I think, 2011, something like that. Um, and we did, we did what, exactly what you saw there, on demand mariachi fiesta. And it was really, really fun. <laughs> and that's one of the things about, like, why, why did we do this thing? Why do we build this product? It seems kind of like, what, what's going on? It's crazy, right? But actually, we built the product because what we wanted to do was test out, hey, how might people, this is at the time, by the way, that people could only, they only had one option. They had, you could get an Uber or you could not get an Uber. Well, how could we build this out in such a way where we want to try and figure out how to, how to create and play with this concept that you might be able to order something else from Uber? And this was actually the very beginning of building that out and creating it. We just want to do it in a really fun way. Um, you know, we, and we did multiple kind of versions of this. Uber ice cream, that was like really popular. And that was actually the, that was the real launch of car types. In fact, what we didn't call out in all of our press materials was that like, oh, you can get ice cream. But did you know you can also get an SUV? Because we never had SUVs before. So you can get an Uber, you can get an Uber SUV, or you can get an Uber X. And like, that was actually really the idea behind it. It's like doing something fun. Um, and then just for fun, I, I thought I'd show you some of the sort of like, this is the evolution of the Uber app over time. So we started out as this big green button and then got better and better and you know you all see Uber app today and it's it's beautiful and lovely but it was a really really fun um, fun experience so being humane and I, I really think there's a way to do things that just brings joy and delight to people in the way that we create and build products so we have another example um, onboarding a different so I 
part of the, the, the real estate industry is quite regulated. And so when you bring people on board, when you, you have to sign a contract with people. And we thought, oh, we're being really clever. We're going to do PDF e-signing. Um, and we, we did. And we, we thought we were being really clever. And it turned out, like, people were sitting there on their little mobile phones and, like, pinching and zooming and trying to click a checkbox. And we're like, this is insane. This is not a good experience. And this is the first time that people are interacting with. We're selling the story of how we're like real estate, technology, experience, we do all this stuff and like we have this really crappy experience. So we need to do better. We need to do better. We need to make sure that people's first experience is actually great. And so what we did is we, we, we sort of recreated the whole idea of like building, signing a contract. And we just did it in a way where it was really simple questions, the way in which we thought about the copy of our questions. We had to do it in a way that made sense in terms of the regulatory requirements of what it is, but it was warm, it was friendly, and like it was just a few simple questions, and you just felt like, yeah, I know how to answer this, I understand how this works, I get what it means, it's really simple and easy for me to do. And once it's done, you just sign on, the, on, on your app and you're done, you get a copy of your contract, it all gets sent through, it's all done. And then people were like, wow, is that it? That was so easy, that was so clean, it felt good. It was just like, all right, cool, and from here, the very next thing is we put you into your portal and we said, hey, here are all of our next steps. This is what we're doing. We're so excited. We're ready to bring you on board. And we created this feeling of, of joy around signing a contract. Now, of course, there's still more we can do. I'm not saying that we're perfect by any means. But that, that was the idea behind it, is that this first experience that we have, we just we want it to feel good. We're selling, an, we're selling the story that we are more than just an average real estate company. We do much more than that. And so we want to be able to create that experience. And so the next level of that, actually, is also that we ended up sort of building a whole reminder workflow out of it. Because sometimes people would be like, oh, I'm busy. I don't have time to do all this stuff right now. We'll get through it. And this, to me, is like kind of that mix of a personal and timely and humane. So we had all of these um, different sort of like characteristics that we have around our owners. And we have a whole set of attributes that we have different special content for. Um, we have multiple sort of reminder flows. So ultimately, the place we're trying to get to is that we want people to sign the contracts and come on to different. And so we sent out these really fun, enjoyable little emails, again, with GIFs. Here's another one that's in there. It's like, did you forget? Seems like you've got that contract to sign. It's got something that you have to do. And it really is warm and friendly. In fact, still to this date, like we get people being like, oh, yeah, that was a great email. I enjoyed getting that. Who enjoys getting an email? But we sent them an email that said, go do this thing for us, and they, and they enjoyed it, and they liked it. And I think that is the mix of stuff. It's like, what can you do as you're building your products to be timely, to be personal, to be humane? Because that, to me, is the thing that inspires, it certainly inspires me on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the kind of stuff that I want to stand behind, that I want to be able to say, I'm proud of having done that. I really believe in it, and I think that it made somebody's life just a little bit better. So I hope you enjoyed that. That's um, what I think about creating uh, great scalable experiences. Again, different.com.au, check out our website. Thanks so much. <laughs>